Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark Skidmore. I'm the director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, today we have Joel Salatin of Polyface Farms as our guest, um, our guest webinar speaker. And um, before I introduce him, I just want to um, talk for a few minutes about the motivation and why I thought this would be a, an excellent presentation. We're very glad to have um, you here, Joel. Um, but we know Thank that. You. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we know that um, farm bankruptcies have, have been continuing. In 2018, we had uh, 500, um, about 500. We know that farmers are struggling with low commodity prices. Uh, here in the Midwest, uh, the flooding and other kind of disaster events, um, relatively high debt loads. Some of this is being driven by um, high farmland uh, real estate prices about of that $409 billion of debt, $251 billion is for real estate. Um, so there's a relationship there. We know also that we're increasingly, um, th um, farmers are to some degree getting squeezed through the distribution network to retail. Um, we also know that um, uh, the male farmer suicide rate is about as high as it is for veterans, about 30% about higher than the national average for men. So there's a lot of stressors. And um, here uh, today we're gonna talk about, uh, or Joel is gonna talk about Polyface Farms, um, which is in the Shenandoah uh, Valley of, of Virginia. Um, the, and I'll, I'll let him talk in more detail, but he and his family over the course of generations have taken a worn out, eroded, abused farm and built a successful, more sustainable, emotionally, economically, and environmentally farm structure. Um, and so I thought, you know, looking for other models, maybe this was a framework or a model that some of our struggling farmers could look to as an example. Um, Joel is also the editor of the Stockman Grass Farmer. He's a columnist and writer for the Pitchfork, Pitchfork Pulpit and Acres USA. So with that introduction, I'd like to pass it on to Joel. And again, Joel, thanks for being here and sharing your thoughts. Well, thank you, Mark. It is a truly an honor and a privilege to, uh, to be with you. I don't, I don't take it lightly and I, I really uh, appreciate it and hope we'll um, share something that's, that's encouraging. The, um, the, the, I guess where I would like to start is um, just to describe a little bit, obviously folks there can see pictures of what we do at our farm. And um, uh, if we look at infrastructure, our, our infrastructure, we want our infrastructure to be mobile, modular, and management intensive. Now, the, the first two are pretty obvious there. You know, it, it, by being mobile, it means that we can farm all these things that you're seeing on that picture. You don't see great big buildings, stationary buildings. Uh, it's all mobile and lightweight, which means it can be moved around, which means that the farm enterprise can be divorced from land ownership. So these enterprises can be dropped in, placed in uh, land that you own, borrow, lease, uh, or have any other kind of a, a, a management agreement to be on. Uh, that's, a, that's a game changer because as you said, Mark, the single biggest impediment to, um, to either farm expansion or succession or even entry either any of those three, the biggest impediment is the price of land. So if you don't have to own the land and you can build mobile infrastructure on, on land that you don't have to own, it, it, it changes the capitalization cost dramatically. Another nice thing is that mobile infrastructure doesn't require building permits. <laughs> and uh, so you don't have as, quite as many licenses to deal with or, or zoning or whatever. Hey, so Joel, 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 before you continue, I just wanted to check with the uh, um, with the participants. Are you getting a flickering on your screen? You can yeah. type in the Zoom chat. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Rosa, will you please take off the the screen share because it's it's a little distracting, and for some reason we have that technology. Technology. I think people have an idea of some of the things that you're engaged in. And also uh, for the group, if you do have some questions along the way, please feel free to include it in the group chat and we'll have time for discussion uh, at the end as well. 
Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted sure. to no, get rid of that distraction. No problem. Yeah, it, it was uh, distracting. You're exactly right. Um, so we've got mobile. The second one is modular. In other words, um, rather, than, rather than scaling up by having a single uh, very large piece of infrastructure, whether it's a building or a machine or whatever, rather we scale up through duplication of small scale um, modules. So, um, so for example, our best example is our, our pastured broiler enterprise. I mean, we raised whatever, 45,000 45, broilers this summer. Uh, we have enough covering that's equivalent to a Tyson chicken house, but it's actually 200 10 foot by 12 foot field modules so that we were able to start with one for basically pocket change, retain the profit, build another one with retained earnings, no debt. And we were able to scale up our production um, without all the upfront capital cost. So, so, so cash flow can be used to scale up because it's modular. That's, that's, that's another big deal. And then finally, management intensive we're in, I mean, and, and that's where our detractors quickly uh, point their fingers and say, yeah, I knew there was a catch here. What you do requires more farmers. And, and I say, yes, guilty as charged, because we have uh, strategically chosen to substitute pharmaceutical intensity, capital intensity, and energy intensity for people intensity. And we think that's a fair trade. And, uh, and what that means is that our equity our equity moves from stuff and infrastructure to knowledge, skill, and customers. So we move from physical to non-physical equity, which makes it more resilient in times of great disruption. And, and we are certainly living in times of great disruption right now. And Mark, you so easily pointed out at the beginning, whether it's you know weather disruption, price disruption, political disruption, whatever it may be, um, uh, there's, you know, it's uh, the business book. Um, it's not the big that eats the small. It's the fast that eats the slow. And so, so business adaptability and resilience is, is the key. It's not size. And so this management intensity puts us in a place where people are our equity and that's easier to, it's, it's more malleable. You know, it's easier to, to either retrain or, change personnel, change procedures, that sort of thing, than it is, um, you know, retrofit uh, massive structural uh, infrastructure, uh, physical infrastructure. Next uh, little idea I want to throw out for everybody to consider is that one of our, our uh, uh, protocols is stacking enterprises. You know, most farms, you ask a farmer, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a, I'm a cattle farmer, I'm a dairyman, or I'm, a, uh, I'm an apple grower, or whatever. You know, they, they identify with a, single, with a single crop or a single uh, commodity. And, uh, and we, we see a lot of value in, um, in, in stacking enterprises uh, so that we have multi-speciation, multi-enterprise, and and even um, tightly tightly related enterprises. Uh, so, for example, um, our cattle we move every day to a new paddock, but three or four days behind them comes an egg mobile, and the chickens scratch through the cow patties, eat out the fly larva, and scratch the cow patties into the soil and lay a hundred thousand dollars worth of eggs as a byproduct of pasture sanitation, and we never have to put the cows through a head gate. The, the, those those are those are systems where they're synergistic, where one plus one equals three, and and then uh, and then the the pastor can also generate an additional income. So we get we get as much value in eggs as we do in beef, uh, and we get way more value in broilers th than we do in in beef. Um, same thing could be with dairy, whether we're we're putting uh, for example you know chickens underneath um, orchard trees or those kinds of things. I mean, I know a guy in Belize, Central America that began running poultry under his citrus grove and it eliminated his need for chemicals because the chickens ate all the dropped fruit where the worms and the pathogens live. They cleaned that up. So not only did he not have the chemical expense, but he had eggs to sell. 
And, and, and so, you know, these are the kind of the, what we call stacking enterprises. Um, next, I just want to touch the idea, and I'm just throwing, I'm just kind of, is this okay, Mark? I'm just kind of throwing out some ideas and, uh, and we'll, 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 we, we can revisit any of them. Uh, Absolutely. At any time. Uh, these, are, these are the kinds of ideas that I thought would be uh, exciting and interesting to talk about. And, and again, for the participants, if you have a question, just type it in there. If you have a comment, we'll also have time for discussion uh, in a little while. Great. Great. So, so the, um, the stacking enterprises um, allows us to, uh, to get a lot more income acre. So rather than just getting beef or eggs or whatever, when we stack beef, turkey, broilers, egg mobiles, at, obviously at different times across the pasture, um, it, it, it jumps our, past, our, our income up into the, the $10,000 per acre range as opposed to just, you know, seven or eight. That, that, that's a game changer. Um, but again, they're leveraging the land and the land costs the same, whether you run multiple enterprises across it or only one enterprise across it. Next idea I wanna just throw out for our consideration is the difference between commodity and craft. A uh, Harvard Business Review did a really fascinating analysis comparing commodity and craft and their point was that you can make money, you can, you can be profitable in both commodity and craft as long as you don't try to, to straddle the fence between the two. The beauty of commodity is that, is, that it, it is homogeneous. It, it doesn't like differentiation. And the beauty of it is that, there, that it is large enough, you know, the, the, the commodity wheat business or beef business or whatever, the commodity uh, industry is so large that it can accept any newcomers and you can grow as fast as you want without price discrimination, you know, as a single, as a single entity. Um, of course, the, the key of commodity is that it is always trying to squeeze margins. So there's a, there's a race to the floor of least cost producer. That's always the, the key is uh, to become the least cost producer because there's no differentiation in the market price. Uh, it, it's all pretty much the same. And so the only way you can win is to become the least cost producer. So the margins are very, very small and you make a profit by, uh, by lots of, you know, lots of items, uh, pounds, bushels, um, gallons, whatever. Craft, on the other hand, works with much higher margins and, uh, and the problem is there, the market is very, very small. So if you produce one dozen eggs that you don't have a, a customer for, the value of that dozen eggs is zero. And so in craft, you're always, uh, your, your scale and your growth are always uh, held in check by the market that you can create. Now, the only way to increase uh, profitability is either to increase margins, which can be done either by raising prices or lowering costs, or to increase turnover. If you have a profitable item, in increase turnover, increase volume. Uh, those are the you know those are the two uh, uh, significant ways. And so in craft, what we tend to do is we focus on on, on margin, increasing margin rather than turnover. Uh, as you as you head into increasing turnover, you move you know closer and closer to commodity. Um, next big idea I'd like to just throw out is is um, the integration of forest land, open land, and a riparian, creating more edge effect. And 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 how do we maintain uh, or build soil in fertility? And so at our farm, uh, we haven't bought a bag of chemical fertilizer in 60 years. Um, but what we do do is large scale composting and, um, and, and we use the pigs to do the turning of the compost. So we integrate, so we have a, a, an industrial chipper, that's our fertilizer budget. We have this big chipper that we then chip um, leftover woods work and, and, and uh, you know, crooked trees, diseased trees, um, junky trees, invasive species, whatever, uh, tops left over from, you know, uh, from lumber from logging or, um, or firewood work. 
we chip that and that becomes our carbonaceous diaper uh, underneath the livestock in the winter. Pigs, chickens, cows, all the livestock in the winter when we're in confinement, uh, they all have a, a carbonaceous diaper, which then is composted uh, and that's our entire fertility program. And so that has enabled us in 60 years to move our organic matter in our soils from 1% organic matter to 8.2% organic matter. Uh, if we knew then what we know now, we could have done it, of course, a lot quicker, but we, you know, you, you got to crawl before you cr crawl before you walk. And, and the, the last, the last kind of big idea I just want to throw out before we kind of mark you lead the, you lead the discussion um, is the whole, uh, when you start down this path, people start being concerned about, well, we're going to have, you know, cows next to chickens and pigs next to cows and aren't, you know, and, and, and aren't we concerned about pathogens and sickness and all that. And so I just want to touch bases momentarily on maintain what I call maintaining a wellness habitat. Um, you know, our farm, just to give you a bit of perspective, um, we're, so we'll, we, we direct market everything. We don't, we don't do the commodity thing. We're in craft. And so we direct market to about um, uh, 4,000 uh, families. We do um, urban drop points and we do ship now nationwide. Um, we, we sell to about 50 restaurants and we do about 800 hogs a year. We're running about 800 head of, I mean, sorry, a thousand head of cattle and we'll sell, you know, about 300 beeves a year. So some of those of course are brood cows, yearlings, all that. Uh, but we're selling about 300 beeves a year. And then, um, and then, uh, like I said, this year we did about 45,000 broilers. We do about, uh, we have about 4,000 layers uh, laying hens. So we're doing a, you know, a hundred thousand dozen eggs a year, um, a along with other things, a little bit of, you know, some lumber and some lamb, uh, duck eggs, rabbits, uh, turkeys. We do about 1500 turkeys and, uh, and we direct market all of this. We don't, we don't sell any of it into the commodity uh, business. We do, we do wholesale of course, to the restaurants and some institute and some institutions like a VA hospital, uh, those sorts of things. But this is not a backyard deal. And yet what, where I'm going with this is we don't have, we literally do not have a vet bill. I mean, we, we maybe see a vet or use a vet maybe once every three or four years in, a, in, a, in an unusual uh, calving situation. But otherwise, we just don't have it. Does that mean we never lose an animal or don't have a sick animal? No, of course, you know, you're going to run these many animals. You're going to have a sick one or a dead one. Uh, once in a while. But uh, what we focus on is maintaining a wellness habitat. Now, there are two ways nature maintains wellness. One is with rest and sunshine. So that's kind of the pasturing idea where we're moving these animals. So all these animals are, are out on pasture. We move them every day to a new uh, paddock and um, and, and, and so there's a, there's a long rest period before they come back. Like the broilers, the broilers are only on a given, um, a given square foot of ground one day a year. So it has a whole year to, um, you know, to, to rest uh, before, uh, before broilers come back on that. Uh, not the same for the egg mobiles or anything, because those are, you know, uh, those are not juvenile birds. And they, it's not as um, intense, not as, not as uh, stocked as densely as the broilers. So one, the one way to create a wellness habitat is rest and sunshine. That's, that's the pasture way. Uh, the second way is with what we call vibrant decomposition. Okay. So, um, so vibrant decomposition, like a compost pile, you know, you can, you can put a lot of toxic stuff in a compost pile and it'll actually just, detoxify it you know it, it's pretty amazing break down all sorts of things um, I mean e e even pretty significant chemicals um, you know roundup whatever uh, can be uh, broken down in and pathogens viruses all sorts of things can be broken down in a compost pile so if we're going to um, 
if we're going to confine animals in a winter situation or in a production situation, and we're going to have them confined with a degree of intensity, we want them to be living on a compost pile, an active, active decomposing, um, we call it a carbonaceous diaper uh, that's actively decomposing, which means the carbon nitrogen ratio needs to be in the 25 or 30 to one ratio, CN ratio. If you don't have that amount, then it, it's not going to actually be decomposing and therefore it won't grow the nematodes that are necessary to attack the viruses and, and the bad bugs. Um, you know, a lot of people are surprised when they realize that 95% of all bacteria, bugs and fungi and everything are, are beneficial. Only about 5% are bad. So the key is not ster uh, uh, sterility. The key is active decomposition. And I make this point, I make this challenge uh, strongly because uh, because in the winter, I'm not opposed to bringing chickens in to more confined, you know, environmentally controlled facilities. Uh, we get we get snow. Uh, it gets very very cold, and it gets pretty pretty uh, uncomfortable for them in the in the winter, uh, as well as the pigs. Um, and so so there's nothing wrong with at least short term bringing stock in for protection, um, but they you never want them to be on concrete on slatted floors or anything like that that can't grow this 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 sponge of biological activity that is the key for creating a habitat in which there's enough good bugs to beat the bad bugs and so uh so that moves us to this whole uh that's closely linked to this whole fertility and carbon discussion is that you know on our farm uh even though we're not that big a place uh, we probably, you know, we use somewhere between, oh, uh, you know, 20 and 25 tractor trailer loads, if not more, of wood chips a year in all of this carbonaceous bedding with the pigs, the rabbits, the chickens, the cows and everything. And, um, and, and that then is our fertilizer budget, which then feeds the soil compost, organic matter. It keeps the animals healthy when we do have to confine them for, for whatever reason. And, and it, it, it then doubles up, not as a, a waste stream toxic liability, but it actually comes out as a beautiful um, uh, positive compost that then builds the soil. And so th those, are, those are just a few of the big ideas and uh, we can go anywhere the discussion would like to lead, but those are just some big ideas. Well, okay, Joel, let's, uh, let's stop there for a few minutes and, um, and invite the, um, the participants to offer up a question um, in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for people to type in their questions, I, I was you know, thinking about uh, two pieces. Um, the first is uh, how do you build your your direct marketing network. And then the second is, is how would somebody uh, who is a farmer who wanted to diversify and begin moving in this direction, what are some initial first steps to take um, to head in this direction if they wanted? Uh, those are, uh, those are great questions. Uh, so, so um, is it okay if I take the, if I take the, um, Second question first, initial first steps before sure. we get into marketing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so initial first steps. So, uh, you know, we talk a lot about climate change today. Well, the hardest climate to change is the climate of the mind. And, and so the, the, first, the first step is to begin becoming immersed in what I would call the innovative or alternative um, agriculture media uh, and and you, you're, you're gonna you're gonna certainly find some stuff down at the extension office but um, uh, I, I'm going to promote you know what I call the alternative um, a lot of the alternative 
stuff out there. And I'm, I'm not at all trying to demean the extension agents, uh, but one of the limitations of the extension agent uh, advice is that it has to be um, whatever, you know, double blind, come out of research projects, that sort of thing. And the kind of things I'm describing too often, they don't have seed money to sprout the research project. I remember, um, you know, 40 years ago, a bunch of uh, PhDs from Virginia Tech came up to see what we were doing. And uh, this, this particular, this was particular visit was regarding uh, feeding kelp, kelp, which is seaweed to, to eliminate pink eye in cows. Uh, a lot of problem with pink eye in cows. And, and, and so anyway, you know, I explained what we we're doing and, um, and, because, you know, since we're about putting, uh, you know, the uh, antibiotic in the conjunctiva of the eye and, you know, uh, patches and treatment procedures, that sort of thing. And I said, well, look, you know, we're, you know, we're running a thousand head of cattle and we have maybe, you know, two or three pink eye cases a year and we don't do any vaccination. We don't do any of this stuff. Anyway, they were very interested in it. And um, so they, they wanted to do some research but they couldn't find anybody to provide the whatever it was, $10,000, $15,000 worth of seed money to launch, to, to, to whatever, to germinate. And, and, I, and I don't know how all this research works, but uh, I know my experience, and this is not, there's been several others beyond the kelp thing, um, but, but the result was no research was ever done, so they couldn't recommend it because there wasn't anybody to put $15,000 and seed money to start a research uh, program to, to study kelp versus, you know, other, other uh, methodologies. And so, um, so my point is that if, if there's one, and I told all these guys after they said, well, you know, we just can't do the research. Uh, they asked me if I had the money. I said, no, I don't have the money for that. Um, but, but they said, look, we simply can't, we simply can't promote anecdotal stuff. And my thing was, well, what's wrong with a disclaimer saying, now look, this hasn't been researched, but there's a guy over here that's trying this and he seems to think it's okay. And, you know, we don't endorse it. We don't stamp of approval on it, but, you know, um, we're just, we're just here to kind of pollinate ideas and, you know, use it at your own risk. If it's something that you think is an interesting idea, you know, try it. Um, and I know that smacks uh, like heresy to scientists, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but anyway, uh, um, I, I'm just being very transparent, sharing my own story, my own saga with the, what I'll call the orthodoxy and the, uh, sometimes the, uh, the inability to be able to jump on an innovative idea or, you know, early in the process. And so, so it, the first steps are, to start getting familiar with, with the alternative media, the alternative information, alternative publications, you know, you know uh, um, get, get wider, more eclectic. And then the second thing is you have to build up your own confidence level with a, with a prototype. So, you know, if you're out there um, and you're a row crop farmer and, uh, and, and you read something that I wrote that says, man, you could make way more money with intensive controlled grazing on perennial pastures than you can with growing corn, don't, don't plant your whole place in <laughs> perennial pasture overnight. You know, uh, uh, take, a, take a little marginal, whatever, you know, five or 10 acres off a corner and plant that down and get, you know, six or seven head of cattle. And, uh, and start to control grazing and play with it and put a water line in, you know, uh, don't, don't sacrifice the mothership uh, with your, with your uh, new idea um, because, because all of this is incremental. It's not spontaneous. Uh, it, it's incremental and you can't Google experience. So especially if you're, if you're kicking some tires and kicking around some new ideas, um, don't threaten the whole mothership uh, with, with, with a different idea. And, and that goes for, you know, that goes for everything. So uh, you got to build up your, your confidence level, uh, in order to, you know, in order to take the next step. So make the steps small and, uh, and doable. And then, um, you know, for, for me, that's enough for initial steps. Uh, I, I just, I just think, you know, you, I can't give somebody a 10 year plan 
because everybody's 10 year plan is different and, um, and everybody's going to progress at different rates. And um, so, so the key is don't do everything at once, start small, make little baby steps, build up your confidence, get acquainted with the entire, you know, um, unorthodox uh, um, agriculture view, you know, subscribe to Stockman Grass Farmer. You know, I, I have no problem giving a shameless plug for the, for the Stockman Grass Farmer magazine. Um, but, you know, there, there are others, you know, there's Acres USA, there's, you know, in Pennsylvania, there's PASA. Uh, but every state has its kind of, a, you know, a rebellious farm group. Um, all right. Now, how to build a direct marketing network there, you know, that's such a good question because most farmers are not marketers. Uh, most of us farmers, you know, we're farmers because we don't like people. <laughs> we, 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 like, we, like our, we like our tractor a lot more than people, you know, it never, never talks back to us or, or says we're stupid and, uh, or our cows for that matter. They're always happy to see us. And so in marketing, you know, you've got to be, uh, you've got to have a little bit of storytelling, a little bit of theater, a little bit of dramatic uh, ability. I mean, you'd have to be a, you know, an extrovert necessarily, uh, but, but you do have to, interacting with people uh, can't put you in a cold sweat. And so, um, and, and there are certainly great storyteller farmers. I mean, there, there are people that have a great gift of gab and, and I mean, obviously I am one, but uh, there, there are certainly a lot more than me. So if, if, if that, if that works on your pair of legs, you know, run for it. Um, but if it doesn't, and don't worry, I'm going to get to a little bit of, you know, establishing a market in a moment, but I need to deal with this issue because it's such an issue because I mean, when I talk about, when I talk about taking, you know, uh, taking a T-bone steak over to somebody and marketing it, half of the farmers break out on a cold sweat. I mean, they can't imagine they, I mean, they would rather get the tractor stuck in a field in February, uh, in a in a February thaw, than imagine going to the neighbor with a you know, with a T-bone steak or a, a you know a, a, a pot pie or cornbread. Um, so this is, marketing often works best with a partner. That partner might be a spouse, might be a child, might be a niece, niece nephew, neighbor, somebody at church, somebody in your acquaintance. But there are people around who literally thrive uh, and just are energized by sales, by marketing, by talking up a product. And so what you do is you put that person on a, on a commission. You don't put them on an hourly wage. Uh, we have 20 people here uh, at Polyface and not a single person's on an hourly wage. I don't believe in them. Um, we're either uh, commission-based, piecework, or salary with, with bonuses, with built-in, you know, um, uh, bonuses that if you do this and this and this, you automatically uh, tap into the, the kind of a profit sharing thing. Um, now, establishing a market starts with one person. A couple rules of marketing. Uh, one is start with one. Well, who's that one going to be? It's going to be uh, it's going to be your tribe. Well, who's your tribe? Your tribe is going to be people who think and eat whatever you're selling. So, uh, like for me, for me, we, we sell, you know, we're not organic certified. We're GMO free, pasture based. So we're, we're definitely food crafters. We're in that food craft business. So you know what? Um, I would, I would market to people who, uh, eat their food out of uh, the sheets uh, gas station. Okay, that, that's not my tribe. And so you have to identify who's your tribe. Who are the kind of people who would buy into what you're doing? If you're going to do a you're going to do a corn maze, uh, you know, for, do agritourism, for example, you're not going to go market that at the local nursing home. <laughs> and I know disparagement on old people. Okay, but you're going to go market that at the local daycare center, right? That's who's going to come out to your corn maze or your pumpkin patch or your agritourism. So you got to think about who, where's the tribe that's going to buy this. And then you need to get your messaging. You need to messaging correct. Marketing is all about solving somebody's fantasy 
or somebody's problem. Uh, so either people are fantasizing about something or they have a problem they want to fix. And so uh, this is where Mark um, um, Simon Sinek, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Simon Sinek uh, and his book, Selling the Why, is so important. He said, you know, most of us, when people ask, they, they want to know what we do, we can tell them what we do. Um, the next step is to tell them how we do it. But if you can ever explain the why, that's what people buy. People buy the why. They don't buy the what and the how. And so in this messaging, we have to frame the why in a way that either feeds their fantasy or solves their problem. And if you can identify the fantasy or the problem that you're, that you're uh, feeding, then that will help you zero in on your, on your messaging and, um, and that'll find your tribe and then you're up and running. Well, that's a, a great uh, response to both questions. Thanks. Uh, are there some questions uh, from the audience that you'd like to add? Um, also, I, I think we're a, a small enough, intimate enough group that if you just like to ask a question, you can just unmute your, your um, audio there and, and ask it if you'd like. Yeah, Michael Darger here. Um, I got a question about the uh, tox the when you said you can put the toxic stuff, you know, in the composting, the the carbonaceous diaper or whatever you call it. That was pretty <laughs> amazing. And yeah. just wondering, you know, I mean, like Roundup uh, now has been alleged to be carcinogenic and things like that. So, um, I mean, have you do you do testing or 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 how do you how do you know that the compost can destroy these things? Haven't done here because don't use that kind of stuff. But there are certainly uh, plenty of of literature uh, showing the efficacy of compost to detoxify things. And in fact, uh, the organic matter in the soil is primarily the basis for actually the chemical companies. Um, uh, what's it called? Their you know their their breakdown their breakdown timeline. Almost every almost every chemical has some sort of a, a breakdown timeline. And what's interesting about that is that um, that it the the, the timeline uh, speeds up in a high organic matter soil and slows down in a low organic matter soil. So all of the testing for the labeling and, and the the whatever the the advertising all done on high organic matter soils. Um, obviously, in most situations, we're working with low organic matter soils. Uh, but that, that's the, that's the subjectivity of the test. You know, the studies, they, they've got, a, they've got a certain bias. So they're going to have this stuff break down, uh, faster. And so, um, I mean, th this is why, for example, uh, New York Cornell university now promotes, um, composting abattoir wastes. So all the guts and, and offal and stuff from, from, uh, slaughterhouses, they ab absolutely lead the nation in protocols and efficacy of composting for, for uh, detoxing um, uh, offal at, at, at slaughterhouses. Um, here in Virginia, I know uh, we, we, are, we are now promoting, um, rather than incineration, it used to be you know, years and years and years ago, the poultry industry, everything was about incineration, your mortalities, they all had to be incinerated and they, they had both on farm and, you know, collective, uh, collective uh, um, regional uh, incineration centers. And, um, and now the, you know, the more accepted uh, procedure is composting. Now there's, you know, there's protocols for how much carbon and, and uh, protect it from the rain and, and the size bin for the size house and the number of birds you're raising and all that. But, uh, composting and, and the reason that all this has developed is because the um, the efficacy of the bacterial fungal breakdown in uh, in the compost is is well proven. Um, you know, Mark Stamets, who's the he's the world guru of um, of mycelium of uh, of mushrooms and and fungi. Uh, I mean, they actually have strains that will eat oil, you know, where 
there can be an oil spill uh, somewhere on a road and they can bring in these, these um, fungi and literally, they literally eat up the, the petroleum in the, in the soil. It's, it's a new, you know, much more efficient way to detoxify um, spills and, and places like that. So I, I think we just are not appreciating what, how amenable the biological uh, world is to, um, you know, to, to cleaning its own nest. And, and it's, it's quite dramatic. Would anybody else like to ask a question? Uh, we're, we're primarily located in the Midwest, Joel, and um, so we have some cold weather in the winter, and it sounds like in your model, um, you spent, you know, the animals spend most of their time, you know, out in the fields. Um, how about for a more severe environment, um, like Minnesota or North Dakota or South Dakota, can it can the model work in that environment, or what are the constraints? Sure. Well, the it depends on the animal. Um, you know, certainly, certainly, cattle with just a bit of wind protection can take almost anything uh, outside, especially if they've got maybe a a grove of trees or something where they can uh, get sheltered up in, but, but cat, you know, cattle are, cattle are pretty tough and they can take a lot. Uh, if you go, you know, pigs and chickens, things like that. No, nah, they're, they're going to need some, they're going to need, definitely need protection. So we are, uh, we are in, uh, we're actually in the same um, horticulture, horticulture hardiness zone as South Dakota. And the reason is because of our elevation here, uh, right where, where we are in Shenandoah Valley. If you look at horticulture maps, you'll always see this finger that juts down into Western Virginia there. And that's us, that's the Shenandoah Valley. We're, you know, our house is 1800 feet and the, uh, the highest point of the farm is at 2800 feet. So we have a thousand feet of elevation uh, on, on the farm and there, there's two weeks there's two weeks of seasonal difference of, of frost, frost free difference between those two. So, so the, uh, on one corner of our farm, season, the days are, um, are uh, um, a April 15 to, uh, I guess it'd be um, August 15. And on the other, it's May 15 to September 15. Um, so, so, you know, the elevation does make a, a pretty significant difference. And so uh, this is all relative. I mean, e every place has its uh, asset and its liability. And so up, up north, um, there, in general, there are certainly more inclement weather. So they might be uh, inside a little longer, which simply means you're going to develop more compost, but it also means that in the summertime, you're going to get pasture regrowth much faster than us down here because you get long that you get longer, um, more sunlight in the day because of the tilt of the earth. So um, it, it, the, amount, the amount of sun, the amount of sun that hits a, a patch of ground in Minnesota, uh, is, is exactly the same as it is down here. The only difference in Minnesota is it's, it's skewed to be more concentrated in the summer and less in the winter than here. So you have a, you have a, a, a you know, a shorter, a shorter time period, but it just means that, that's why you can grow cabbage so much faster than we can. Uh, you know, garden vegetables. I mean, uh, look at Alaska. I mean, it was up there. I was up there, you know, and in, in the winter and, and it, it, it never got light, you know, all day long. And, um, and, but in the summer, it stays light 24 seven, they can grow, they can grow a, a six pound cabbage in, um, you know, in three weeks, because in three weeks of their high summer, they get as much sun as we get in, you know, six or seven weeks. So it, it, it is relative, it, 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 it all applies. And you just have to do 
uh, tweaking to, um, you know, tweaking to adapt to, you know, local conditions. Right. Uh, I know, for example, people that are doing pastured poultry like us up in, you know, up in the colder areas, often what they'll do is, um, is put some extra plastic on the shelter uh, early in the spring as, as kind of an extra, uh, kind of a cloach. We've even done that here. And uh, we started a batch of chicks one year uh, in, a, in a snowstorm. And we had some little uh, plastic things that we literally uh, clothes pinned uh, to, the, to the shelters to button them down tighter. Those chicks were happy as they could be in there uh, because we had them down pretty tight even in the snow and did just fine. So, um, I mean, the, the, I mean, I'm talking three, three week old Cornish cross uh, broiler chicks. And, uh, you know, we did lose more than we would in the middle of the summer. Our mortality was higher, but it wasn't, it wasn't so high that, you know, that we, that it wasn't profitable. Well, I, we've been going for about 45 minutes and it, it's been a fascinating um, discussion and uh, to listen how you uh, have set up your business and your farm. Um, are there any uh, remaining comments or questions from the audience? Just yeah, I'm Bill. here. Uh, Bill Hendry and I'm with MSU Extension. I'm a district director, so probably less qualified to, to make any comment or ask a question about the technical aspect, but I think Joel is correct about that, the difficulty that we face in extension uh, in needing to, to promote research uh, backed at minimum um, information and make sure it's accurate, which is very important. So, I mean, I think the, if, if he has any thoughts, if you have any thoughts, Joel, on how we can bridge that gap so that um, maybe we can make headway. I mean, I know it with extension, and I don't know who else is on the call, but we've got our grass-fed herd up uh, in the northern part of the state. A lot of research is being done there, but just some thoughts on bridging that gap. Well, wow, this is a great, a, a great um, question. I, I would simply um, I'd send a couple things. One is every time I've gone on, on extension farm tours, I find them extremely beneficial. So anything you can do to stimulate farmer to farmer pollen, direct, direct farmer to farmer pollination is very, very positive. All those kinds of things are, those kinds of things are good. Um, and the second, the second one is, <laughs> is simply to, to figure out a way to offer, uh, to offer, un whatever unsanctioned ideas, uh, you know whatever disclaimer you got to put on, um, is fine with me, but um, you know it, when I talk to an extension agent privately, and he said, well, you know I was over at uh, I was over at Jim Smith's farm last, last week, and and he was doing this, you know, and so I, I think you are free to, to say those kinds of things. Um, and I have found those to be very, very beneficial. And so in a lot of ways, um, I don't want to diminish the research that extension does a lot of ways. There's a lot of research being done, just, just experiments out on farms, you know, and, and if there's a way to, 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 to be a bumblebee and pollinate that, uh that, that i don't know maybe if you could maybe if you could uh, create a a a, pro a protocol of of unscientific um information dissemination <laughs> just, just just something where you could um where you could feel a little more free because you guys you guys meet all sorts of people i mean that's your job and, and, you know, I'm out here moving cows. Well, I'd love, I'd love to hear from one of you guys who's been on 10 different places in the region that is moving cows. Uh, and, and I mean, the fact is that out on, out on the farm, innovation and ideas are coming way faster than, than 
um, whatever plotting, stodgy research can can deal with it. And uh, you know, it, even if it's a if it's a slicker way to set up a pump. I mean, well, I mean, for I mean, at our farm, for example, for for years and years and years, uh, we've now been. You're, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, windrow composting, you know, where you make compost piles and you put them in windrows, you know, and you turn them. And uh, so in, in the cows, we feed in this uh, hay shed in the winter with hay. Uh, we've got enough roof space to accommodate 300 head. And uh, we've got the sides built so that we can go four feet deep with this uh, bedding pack. So it starts out, you know, real small and goes deeper and deeper and deeper. We keep lifting the hay gate. The hay gates are all on pulleys. We just hang them and we can just ratchet them up every few inches. We just go in there and add new bedding with a, you know, with a PTO manure spreader, put the wood chips in there and just spin them off. And we add corn to it. That whole bedding pack is, uh, is anaerobic. So it's fermenting. So in the spring, that thing is full of, you know, tons and t uh, of, of, uh, of um, fermented corn. So rather than double handling and building uh, windrow compost piles, which is the orthodox way to do it. Um, we put pigs in, pigs seek the fermented corn, they stir it all up like a big egg beater and turn it from anaerobic to aerobic compost and it doesn't cost us any petroleum, machinery, time or anything and then we spread that on the fields as, as wonderful, wonderful compost. Um, you know, that that is an example of a of a low cost animal driven innovative way to do something that the orthodoxy takes a lot of machinery petroleum and time to do um and and the fact that even even the extension agents who have been here and who've seen it and said wow that's really cool the fact that they feel unable to speak about it even even it, it, it it's just a bummer <laughs> <laughs> and i i don't know i don't know what the answer is but uh but um it would sure it would sure be neat to see a little more um freedom because in private conversations, I know that a lot of extension agents are just full of really cool ideas. They've been all these interesting, cool places, and they got this stuff to share. But you know, it, it can't go any any official publication and be widely disseminated, uh, official officially disseminated, um, without additional scrutiny. That's a great question, Bill. Thanks for for asking that. Really good question, and, and, and you know, I, I'm I'm a a researcher as well, and and we try to you know try to have that rigorous process to evaluate, and it really is true that sometimes we don't have the funding um, that is needed to do the kind of formal research so that we can say something in a formal way, and so that that's a, you know, that's a valuable resource, right? To have a research base in the documents that you share, but it is also um, a potential limitation, especially if there's just no funding available to, to do it. And some, sometimes there's not a lot of incentive to, to fund um, this kind of stuff because it doesn't, it requires only your own ingenuity to do. It doesn't require, you know, that you buy anything in order to do it. Right. Right. Well, I, I know we've kept you for almost an hour, Joel, and I really um, thank you very much for a really informative webinar. I appreciate um, your time. And um, we've posted, um, or just again, put the link to your website, Polyface Farms, so others can yes. have a look at it. And I don't know if you want to say anything about that um, before we close off. Well, I mean, just that we, we try to keep that uh, current and it's got a lot of, um, you know, a lot of links and a lot of different things in it. I, um, you know, I do a daily blog um, as well as editing the Stockman Grass Farmer. So I, I, I my pen is, uh, I'm now about, about a 50% farmer, 50% farming and 50% uh, informational. But um, uh, yeah, that website will, will get you in touch with you know, other materials that we might have or support or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
thank thank you thank you so much for this opportunity and and i i am delighted to to share and um and and honored to have this platform it doesn't it doesn't come every day and uh so this is this is the kind of bridge platform um that the you know, when, when bill asked the question uh the fact that uh, bill that you're on this webinar uh means to me that you're one of the bridge builders and so um keep building <laughs> Well, we, uh, again, appreciate your time and your thoughts. And um, again, thank you. And we will, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. I thought that was really informative. Good. Really great. Good. Uh huh. And I, I think I think you're you're right. I mean, a lot of good research comes out of the um, through the university system, but if you can't get funding, even if it's a great idea and it's a model, and so I you know I, I 